So, um, as, as you know, both HIV and HCV are, are model chronic virus infections where you see that you get uh, high levels of viremia after the infection, and then you get, you get control of the virus, but the virus isn't completely controlled. So the immune system seems to control the virus partially, but it fails to completely control the virus, and you have ongoing virus replication. And what seems to be one of the most important cells that are important for that first initial virus control is the CD8 T cell, or the cytotoxic CD8 T cell. And uh, a number of studies, you probably know, have shown that in HIV and SIV, the CD8 T cells are really important in that initial uh, viral control and then maintaining viral control at a certain level of viremia. <clears throat> and I just want to re remind you of how the CD8 T cells, or T cells in general, are um, induced to control virus. Uh, the CD8 cell first is a naive cell that gets primed by the virus antigen, and then it gets uh, uh, activated and becomes an effector T cell, which produces, uh, for CD8s, uh, effector substances like perforin and granzyme. And then once the levels of antigen go away, once the CD8 T cell seems to be eliminating the antigen, the CD8 cell then becomes a memory cell, which has a different uh, pattern of markers, including the IL-7 receptor, which is, allows it to survive for long periods of time, whereas the effector cells can't survive as well. Uh, but the, their job is any, anyways to get rid of the, the antigen when it's present. So in, um, in the early 1990s, uh, Rolf Zinkernagel's group had actually uh, tried to understand the mechanism of why viruses persist uh, despite the presence of CD8 uh, priming or a CD8 immune response. And he developed this model of a chronic virus infection. And he, it was, it, it was, he used the, the RNA virus LCMV. And uh, what he found was that if you give um, a strain of LCMV called the docile strain, if you only give 100 units, 100 platforming units of that virus to the mice, the mice could actually get rid of the, uh, the, the, the virus infection <clears throat> within a couple of weeks, and um, they have a strong CTL response. Now, if he, all he had to do was just give a higher dose of that virus to the same animal, and then what he found was that this, this was 10 to the seventh platforming units of um, a virus, the animals actually could not clear the virus, and they actually ended up dying of um, immunopathologic disease. And what, when they characterized the T cell responses to LCMV, they found that they had an initial expansion of um, CTLs to the glycoproteins of LCMV, and then these, these T, T cells then disappeared after about a week. And um, this was only specific for the virus that you were infecting, so if he looked at T cells against other viruses in the same mice, he didn't see the dysfunction. So it was very virus specific. And these the, the, the studies were summarized as that you would get this effect depending on how much virus you gave. So if you gave more virus, and if your virus replicated very rapidly, it was easier to induce this effect. And also it seemed to depend on certain MHCs. So certain T cells that bound, that, that were associated with certain MHCs had a higher tendency to uh, be dysfunctional or lose their effect. And this is a typical ex example of some of the experiments that were done um, in, these, in, in, uh, in that paper. So we have a tetramer staining um, of two different epitopes against LCMV. And if you use a LCMV virus called the Armstrong strain, all mice are able to get rid of uh, that virus and you get really good levels of CD8 T cells against those two epitopes. But with the uh, docile strain, when you get the chronic infection, you get deletion of the one uh, T cell, and the other T cell is present, but then when you look at levels of cytokine production, um, they're, they're not there. <clears throat> what was found is, was that if you did the same experiments and use an antibody to delete the CD4 T cells from these mice, the effect of, of deleting and dysfunction of the CD8 T cells was even amplified. So that was, that's the last um, set of uh, data right there. So, so it seems like de depleting the CD8 T cell, depleting the CD4 T cells enhances the induction of T cell exhaustion. So this has been studied quite extensively by, by John Wary in uh, University of Pennsylvania, and he's developed a model of T cell exhaustion in chronic virus infections. 
So in, in that sense, you have an effector CD8 T cell that's induced by a virus, and if the CD8 T cells get rid of the virus completely, as an ac acute virus infection, such as the Armstrong strain, if you sample those CD8 T cells in the blood of those animals, the CD8 T cells, after, um, um, af after being cultured with uh, virus peptides or virus antigen, produced uh, a really good functional response. They produce lots of cytokines, such as IL-2, interferon gamma, and TNF-alpha, and they also proliferate quite well. However, in chronic virus infections, what you see is that because the virus is persisting, you get varying degrees of T cell dis uh, dysfunction when you take those T cells out of the, uh, the animal and stimulate them with um, virus-specific peptides. Initially, you might see decreases of IL-2 only, but preservation of interferon gamma and TNF-alpha, but uh, some T cells lose all cytokines, some of them will only produce uh, interferon gamma, and sometimes some T cells, again, some apoptosis will be completely deleted, or they undergo extensive apoptosis. And it seems like the more antigen that's present during the chronic virus infection, the greater T cell dysfunction that we see. So HIV uh, infection, the T cells in HIV infection have very typical characteristics of um, T cell exhaustion. And this makes sense because in HIV infection, you get targeting of the CD4 T cells early on. You get destruction of a lot of CD4 T cells, especially the ones that are HIV specific. So that sort of fits this with the idea of um, not having T CD4 T cells might um, exacerbate exhaustion. You have high levels of antigen in, in HIV. And we also see a progressive dysfunction of uh, T cells and a loss of proliferation. In addition, you see altered immunodominance in HIV infection. So where, whereas you're targeting certain epitopes early in the infection, you lose those epitopes later on in the infection, probably because they're, 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 um, they undergo apoptosis and become completely depleted. So over the past about 10 years now, people have been looking for uh, T cell markers that could maybe mark these exhausted T cells. And so what immunologists first did was they just looked at all the molecules that are involved in T cell activation. And this, this chart looks at a number of families of molecules that are important in T cell activation and T cell priming. And, and you can actually see about two major families. There's the, the B7 family in which CD28 is a, is a, is a um, major molecule in, and also the TNF uh, family and the TNF um, receptor superfamily. <clears throat> most of these molecules have on, on their surface the immunoglobulin domain, which is very typical of most um, stimulatory, immune stimulatory uh, molecules. So the first uh, molecule that was first found to be associated with T cell exhaustion is the PD-1 and PD ligand-1 uh, family of molecules, where PD-1 is expressed on the T cell and the ligand is expressed on the antigen presenting cell. And there were a number of papers that showed that in a number of chronic virus infections, including LCMV, HIV, as well as hepatitis C virus, that PD-1 is upregulated on CD8 T cells in general, as well as the um, virus-specific CD8 T cells. And more importantly, was when you, when you decrease the antigen by giving heart, the levels of PD-1 would decrease on the T cells. And if you took the cells out of, out of the from the patient ex vivo and stimulated them in vitro with peptides in the presence of antibodies that blocked uh, PD-1 interacting with PD ligand-1, you, you would rescue the immune defect of these um, <clears throat> dysfunctional T cells. Now, what has been found, though, with, with uh, PD-1 expressing HIV-specific cells is that the main dysfunction of these cells appears to be um, in enhanced apoptosis and decreased proliferative ability. But these PD-1 expressing cells are still able to produce um, a, cer a certain amount of cytokines, such as interferon gamma. So it seems that PD-1 expressing cells are, are not completely exhausted, but they probably have some early stages of exhaustion. And the signaling pathways of PD-1 have been really w uh, easily worked out because the cytoplasmic domain of PD-1 has some uh, motifs on it that, are, that, are, that have been very well uh, recognized. They're called um, ITSM and ITIM motifs. And it's been shown that um, that uh, um, molecules that express some of the that ITIM motifs and ITSM motifs on the cytoplasmic domain, when they get phosphorylated, can uh, recruit um, uh, a family of, of enzymes called phosphatases. And so what's felt to be happening in PD-1 stimulation is that when the T cell that expresses PD-1 contacts its ligand, gets activated and it phosphorylates, 
its ITIM domain, and that will recruit phosphatases. And those phosphatases then will dephosphorylate all the kinases that are in its vicinity during T cell activation through the CDR, um, CD3 TCR receptor. So it seems like the mechanism of how PD1 works is that it dephosphorylates um, the, um, the important um, uh, molecules that are involved in uh, TCR uh, stimulation. In addition, a recent paper showed that PD1 signaling also um, activates this transcription factor, BATF, which is also a negative regulatory uh, factor. The, the other interesting thing about the PD-1 pathway is that not only can you signal through PD-1, but you can also signal through PD, uh, the, the, the PD-1 ligand. And Rafik's group showed that signaling through the PD-1 ligand actually makes the APC um, immunosuppressive by, in, by inducing um, IL-10 production. Now, we, uh, our lab with, uh, with Doug Nixon have been studying another family of molecules called the TIM molecules, standing for T-cell immunoglobulin mucin domain molecules. And these molecules, there is still very little uh, known about how they function, but their structures are, are shown right here. And what they do is they have an immunoglobulin domain on the top and then a mucin domain further down, and fairly short cytoplasmic domains. And it's been shown that TIM1 and TIM4 are upregulated on Th1 cell, Th2 cells, and TIM3 is upregulated on Th1 cells. And the structure of um, TIM3 is shown there and PD-1 is shown there. They, they actually look quite somewhat similar, probably because they're, they all, they're all involved with the, um, they all have, they're all immune, immunoglobulin superfamily genes. And the, the ligand for TIM3 is, one, one ligand has been found and that's found to be galactin 9, which is right here. So galactin 9 has, is a molecule that has two carbohyd carbohydrate recognition domains, and those CRD domains actually bind to the um, glycosylation motifs on TIM3. So these are, um, I guess this doesn't work, these are glycosylation motifs here, and it's felt that galactin 9 binds to this glycosylation motif to, an, to interact with TIM3. Now TIM3 also, uh, interacts probably with other molecules that we're still trying to figure out what they are. Um, there have been some papers to show that phosphatidylserine, which is expressed on apoptotic cells, can also bind to uh, TIM3, not, but not on its glycosylation uh, regions. I just included this slide for your interest. You can, when you get the slides, you can uh, read those, but it just summarizes previous work on TIM3. So what we did is we looked at the levels of expression of TIM3 on, um, in HIV-infected individuals, and what we found is that when you look at CD4s and CD8 cells and uh, look at TIM3 expression, you see that it's elevated in HIV infection compared to HIV uninfected people compared to isotype control. Uh, this is using a polyclonal antibody uh, to TIM3, which gives, gives the best staining for TIM3. And when you look at cohorts of individuals, so we looked at TIM3 expression on uh, HIV uninfected people, we looked at during acute infection, chronic progressive infection, and in um, HIV infected long-term long controllers in which they can control the virus without drugs, you can see that TIM3 expression is increased on CD4s and CD8s during um, acute and chronic uh, HIV infection. And this is, seems to be associated with the levels of virus. So the more virus that's found in the blood, the higher levels of TIM3. In addition, if you look at actually the HIV-specific cells in comparison to other T cells of other virus specificities, TIM3 seems to be upregulated. So here is a CMV-specific T cell from the same patient, uh, EBV-specific, and then we have two HIV-specific cells. And we see that TIM3 is higher on the HIV-specific cells compared to the um, T cells from the same patient, same time point, that are directed against other viruses such as CMV or Epstein-Barr virus. And when we put all the data together from different patients, we see that TIM3 is generally higher on those cells that are HIV-specific from different patients compared to um, Epstein-Barr virus, influenza, or CMV. The interesting thing is that the levels, though, of TIM3 expression seems to vary um, between different patients, even with the same epitope, and we don't know why that is. We think it's possibly related to the level of virus within each individual patient. <clears throat> 
If you take CD8 cells or CD4 cells from HIV-infected patients and stimulate them with HIV antigens and then look at the levels of interferon gamma production and see which ones, what, see which ones uh, correlate that with expression of TIM3, you'll find that the TIM3 positive cells produce much less interferon gamma than the TIM3 negative cells. And this is, this is found with interferon gamma and also with TNF-alpha. And this is an experiment that Lish actually did where he took uh, CD8 T cells from an HIV-infected individual and sorted them for TIM3 negative versus TIM3 positive, and then he stimulated them through the CD3 receptor with antibodies and then looked to see whether they proliferated through CFSC dilution. And you can see that the TIM3 high cells um, don't proliferate as well as the TIM3 uh, low cells. And again, similar to PD-1, if you try to block uh, TIM3 signaling by culturing with an antibody to TIM3 in the pre and then stimulate the CD8 cells with antigen. Here we did, used HIV gag. You see better proliferation in the presence of a TIM3 antibody compared to an isotype control, meaning that this, the TIM3 pathway is important in suppressing uh, CD8 function. Um, Rafi Ahmed's group actually showed that there are at least two different populations of exhausted cells. There is one population of cells that expresses PD-1, and you can rescue their function by using PD-1 antibodies, but there was another population of cells that you couldn't rescue, and this is probably the TIM3 expressing population that, we, that, that I'm de uh, describing. <clears throat> we then wanted to, we know that the TIM3 uh, expressing cells don't proliferate and don't produce cytokines, but we were really, we really wanted to know whether the, the TIM3 expressing cells, um, whether they were able to um, kill uh, infected target cells. So, we, so the important function of a CD8T cell is obviously cytotoxic ability. So we wanted to test the cytotoxic capacity of TIM3 expressing cells. So this is an experiment where we uh, looked for perforin expression on CD8T cells and compared the TIM3 positive cells versus the TIM3 negative cells. And we, we expected that, that the TIM3 positive cells should express less perforin, but we actually found the opposite. We found that when we looked at the TIM3 positive cells, they expressed much more perforin than the TIM3 negative cells. And this, this is summary data of um, all patients that we looked at, but this was a bit of a surprise that TIM3 positive cells actually have more perforin on them than the TIM3 negative cells. And the same thing happened when you actually um, gated for HIV-specific CD8 T cells. So here's a tetramer stain to an HIV uh, peptide in the GAG region. And when, when you uh, gate for those HIV-specific cells and then look at TIM3 expression, and then if you compare the TIM3 high to the TIM3 low cells, the TIM3 high cells have more perforin than the, than the uh, TIM3 uh, low HIV-specific cells. So that was another big surprise for us because we thought that these cells should be defective. So then when we actually looked at the function of these um, TIM3 positive cells, we, 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 we actually did a number of assays to look at the function. And one assay we did is we looked for perforin release after exposure to HIV peptides. So here is an example of summary data taken from five chronic progressors where we took their PBMs, their CD8 cells, exposed them to um, um, gag peptide pools, and then looked at perforin release. And then we did the same experiment with an antibody to TIM3 to block TIM3 signaling. And what we found was that when we added an antibody, we got more perforin release than when we didn't add the antibody and had an isotype control. So this means that, um, the, uh, that blocking TIM3 could enhance perforin release from the CD8 T cells. Now, this was, this was a group of um, viremic controllers. These were HIV-infected patients that controlled virus well, and they didn't express much TIM3 on their cells. And as, as you'd expect, they don't, they, by adding the TIM3 antibody, you won't get enhanced perforin release. Then we, d we wanted to see whether the CD8 T cells could actually suppress active virus infection in vitro. And the experiment we did here is we just took uh, CD8 cells uh, from patients from either chronic progressors or non-progressors, and then co-cultured them with their own CD4 cells that were infected with an HIV um, virus. And then they were left in culture for about a week, and then we measured P24 expression. 
And we did those conditions in the presence or absence of the TIM3 antibody. And what you can see here is that when we have the TIM3 antibody, there are um, much less infected CD4 T cells than when you have the isotype control. And this is the summary data. So by adding the antibody, you can improve the ability for CD8s to suppress um, HIV infection in vitro. The antibody didn't work in long-term non-progressors, which is what you'd expect, because they don't express much um, TIM3 on their surface. Then the other assay we did that actually directly measures cytotoxicity is a Granzyme B assay. And the way this assay works is we took CD4 cells from patients and um, transfected them with um, RNA from HIV gag to make them express HIV antigens. And then we uh, added CD8 T cells to see whether the CD8 T cells could um, actually kill those, those autologous CD4 T cells. And we added this um, substance called the granzyme substrate. And it's, what it is is it's a substrate for the granzyme enzyme that when it gets cleaved, it'll release a um, fluorescent dye. And this is an example of the assay working here, where when you add CD8 T cells, um, you, you get expression of this um, fluorescent uh, <coughs> cells that are fluorescing. So what we see is that when in the control conditions, we only get 9.4% of the um, CD4 cells cleaving granzyme B, but when we add the antibody to TIM3, we get about tw almost 20% or twofold increase in granzyme B um, activity. And this is summary data of uh, all the patients that were studied. So this shows that blocking TIM3 enhances the uh, ability for the T cells to, um, <clears throat> to release granzyme and then, act and, and then kill the CD4 T cell. So we were kind of surprised because this, the TIM3 positive cells express more perforin, so shouldn't they be doing a better job? But, but, the, but, but you need the antibody to, to, to block TIM3. So this, is, this experiment shows that, gives an explanation of, as to why the TIM3 positive cells might not be able to um, respond properly, even though they, they contain large amounts of perforin. And what we find is that, is that when you look at TIM3 expression, by uh, CD107A expression in the presence of GAG, you see that most of the um, CD107A expression is in TIM3 negative cells. So this suggested to us that the TIM3 positive cells are unable to degranulate. And this uh, experiment shows that when you add the TIM3 antibody, oh, sorry, this isn't the experiment, this is the next one. So the next experiment, what we did is we added the TIM3 blocking antibody and what we find is that we see much more CD107A expression in the presence of um, HIV antigens. And this is summary data showing that uh, when we block TIM3, in this case we used a soluble form of TIM3 to bind to the ligand, you get increased uh, degranulation. So in summary, these are the properties of TIM3 positive T cells in chronic HIV infection. They have poor cytokine production, they don't proliferate, they apoptose, they, they can't um, kill um, their targets because they can't degranulate. And even though they express large amounts of perforin, we call, in, in the lab we call these TIM3 positive cells constipated CD8 T cells, because they've got lots of stuff but they can't release it. Um, in addition, we, you can upregulate TIM3 by um, making the T cells proliferate, either with cytokines, especially IL-2 or IL-15. Um, if you infect T cells with HIV, they will not upregulate TIM3, so HIV does not directly upregulate TIM3. And we also know that in HIV infection, there's, you, you get bacterial translocation and, and lipopolysaccharide released in the blood, but we don't find that lipopolysaccharide induces TIM3 either. So it seems like the things that induce TIM3 is constant immune activation with gamma C chain cytokines and proliferation. The more the T cells proliferate, during the next proliferation, they upregulate TIM3. But we've been trying to figure out how is TIM3 working? How is TIM3 suppressing the, um, the T cell response? The cytoplasmic domain of TIM3 does not have any ITAMs or ITSMs to make you think that it's re recruiting a, a um, canonical phosphatase. So we don't really know how TIM3 is suppressing the T cell response. And so we think that obviously TIM3 is, is acting somewhere in, in what we call the immune synapse. And the immune synapse consists of the CD3 receptor, MHC and peptide, CD4, and co-stimulatory molecule like CD28. And the immune synapse is found in areas of the cell 
called lipid rafts. So the first question we wanted to ask was, is this TIM3 found in lipid rafts? So this is an experiment that actually answered that. So what, the way to determine whether a molecule is found in lipid rafts is you just lyse the cells, and then you, do put, the, you put the lysate on a sucrose um, centrifugation gradient. And what, we, what you find is that lipid rafts usually um, are, found, are the lightest molecules because they have lots of fat in them. So lipid rafts will be found on the top of your sucrose gradient. <clears throat> and then what you do is you just take all of these layers and run them on a gel to determine um, whether the cell that you're interested is in that gradient. And what, what you do is a Western blot and then use an antibody to the, mo to the molecule of interest that you want, and you can see whether that molecule is found in the, um, in the layer. So layer one is lipid rafts. And the way you can prove that layer one is lipid rafts is that you can use an antibody to GM1, and GM1 is a gly glycophospholipid that's, that's found in uh, lipid rafts. And so this is an example of one experiment, and here is the, the positive control GM1. So we did find GM1 in the first fraction, which means that we were able to isolate lipid rafts. And here's the antibody to TIM3. So TIM3 is found in lipid rafts. <clears throat> we wanted to see whether, this is another experiment where we wanted to see whether if we took the lipid rafts, um, and the methods is on the left if you're interested, and added galactin 9, does galactin 9 increase the amount of uh, TIM3 found in the lipid rafts. And the, the way this experiment was done is that T cells were stimulated to upregulate TIM3, and then beads that were coated with CD3 antibodies um, were reacted with the, with the lysate of these T cells, and then the lipid rafts would bind to these beads that express CD3 antibodies. And then we would take the beads and uh, wash them and, and elute what was off the beads and then look and see what molecules were present. And what we find is that if you add galactin 9 to the cells, there's much more TIM3 found uh, binding to the beads, which means that galactin 9 seems to recruit TIM3 to the lipid rafts. So we know that TIM3 now is being brought into the lipid rafts. So the question is, what, how is TIM3 interfering with um, T cell signaling? And the way people look at T cell signaling at the immune synapse is, is one way is to do immunofluorescence. And when you look at the immune synapse through immunofluorescence, you actually can see different areas uh, in the immune synapse, which recruit different molecules. Usually the CD3 receptor uh, and the, the, more, the more important um, uh, kinases are recruited into the center of the immune synapse, and the less important molecules are recruited to the, to the distal portions of the immune synapse. Here's an example of one experiment where you can have a B cell that interacts with the T cell. The B cell presents the antigen to the T cell, and then here's where you see the immune synapse. So this is an example of some experiments we've done on cells where we upregulated TIM3 on the cells with cytokines and stimulating them, and then we co-cultured these T cells with B cells that expressed SEB, and then we wanted to, to uh, see what these cells were doing. So here are three T cells, and in this experiment, what we did is we stained the T cells for TIM3, which is green, uh, the nucleus is blue, and for a phosphotyrosine anti antibody. So this is an antibody that binds to anything that's phosphorylated. And uh, when you stimulate through the CD3 receptor, you get lots of um, phosphorylated proteins. And what we see here is that the two cells that express large amounts of TIM3 have much less yellow or phosphotyrosine molecules than the cell that expresses low levels of TIM3. Here's another example. So it seems like the... Um, the TIM3 expressing cells have, are less phosphorylated. You see much less uh, phosphorylation occurring. This is an example of an experiment where we're looking at actual immune synapse formation between uh, B cells and T cells. And here is an example of the CD3 stain, which is yellow, and C that is right there is the immune synapse. This is the same cell that's stained with TIM3, and you can see that TIM3 is actually also migrating to the immune synapse. So what we did is we actually counted the amount of immune synapses present in cells that expressed TIM3 versus those that didn't express TIM3. And we found that the cells that did express TIM3 had less formed immune synapses, as demonstrated by, heat, by this type of staining, than the, than the cells that um, didn't express TIM3. If you added an antibody to TIM3, 
to block TIM3, we found that we could find much more immune synapses. And this sort of, uh, this, this graph correlates the number of immune synapses we could count through immunofluorescence uh, when we added the antibody versus when we didn't add, add the antibody. So in summary, TIM3 is recruited to the immune synapse by galactin 9. TIM3 is then phosphorylated, which I haven't shown you, but we, we have evidence now that galactin 9 actually phosphorylates uh, TIM3. But now we want to understand, okay, so what's happening? Is TIM3 now just interfering with um, interactions between um, the CD3 uh, receptor activation? Is it interfering and, and blocking other uh, molecules that are in port kinases that can, um, that, that are involved in the, in the T cell signaling cascade? Or is it recruiting phosphatases? So these are things that we, we need to, to uh, do further, and we're gonna be doing confocal microscopy for those experiments. So these are, this is a summary slide of all the T cell surface markers that are associated with uh, T cell exhaustion in different uh, virus infections uh, for your use. So you can see that, that, that a number of these um, negative um, inhibitory receptors are upregulated in these virus infections. And generally what's found is that the more um, negative regulatory um, receptors that are upregulated on a T cell, it seems like the more exhausted it is. <clears throat> and there's good data to show that when you block these uh, molecules with antibodies, you can improve uh, function uh, of the T cells. And this is an example of a, of a paper looking at chronic LCMV infection, where if you use an antibody to both PD-1 and TIM-3, you get synergy in reducing uh, levels of, um, of virus of LCMV. There was also a paper that showed uh, synergy with PD-1 and LAG-3 antibodies. So the way that we can look at T cell exhaustion now is that um, in early T cell exhaustion, you get up, definitely get upregulation of PD-1, but in later stages of exhaustion, you get these other um, uh, inhibitory uh, molecules, and TIM3 seems to be a feature of late uh, T cell exhaustion. Now the big question is though, what induces the upregulation of TIM3 and PD-1 on these HIV-specific T cells, and why is that? Is it just chronic TCR stimulation? So in these infections, the T cells are seeing high levels of virus constantly uh, for weeks to months on end, and so they're getting chronic stimulation through the T cell receptor. So is that the reason why it's being upregulated? Um, and if it is being upregulated, why is it being upregulated? Is it just to avoid immunopathology? So if, you're, if you have CD8 T cells that are activated for long periods of time, are these um, negative regulatory molecules just upregulate so that the body can prevent tissue damage in, in the vicinity of the virus. Um, and it, we still don't know whether the lack of CD4 help early in HIV infection increases the predisposition for TIM3 and PD-1, like we see in the um, LCMV model. Um, and the big question is, if you can reverse CD4 dysfunction early in infection, can you prevent um, TIM3 and PD-1 upregulation in chronic infection? <clears throat> now, there's one thing that you need to know about, and this is, PD-1, 2B4, LAG-3, TIM-3, all these negative uh, mole molecules are actually all induced during acute virus infections. So if you look at any acute virus infection, uh, such as influenza, <clears throat> Armstrong LCMV, you will see upregulation of these, quotes, negative um, regulatory molecules. But once the virus infection is cleared, they get downregulated on the T cells. So the only difference is that in chronic um, infections, they don't get downregulated, they're maintained. So it's still unclear whether these T cells taken during this phase are dysfunctional compared to the T cells that are taken during the chronic, chronic phase. My sense is that they aren't dysfunctional during the acute infection, even though they upregulate all of these uh, negative inhibitory molecules. So I think the upregulation of these molecules is not by itself enough to induce an exhausted state. I think there's something else going on, and these, are, these molecules are upregulated in association uh, with exhaustion. There has been a number of papers that have actually been looking at transcriptional uh, regulation of exhausted T cells, and a lot of this work has come from um, John Wary's group, and this slide just summarizes what that group has found so far. And if you look at the papers, actually the data is very confusing to understand. So it's very difficult to understand what the transcriptional regulation of ex 
of exhausted T cells means. So what has been shown is that T cells that are exhausted express high levels of this transcription factor called BLIMP1. So that is one characteristic of exhausted cells. But if you look at BLIMP1 knockout mice, you can still make exhausted T cells in them. So BLIMP1 in, in it, of itself is not enough to make an exhausted phenotype. There was also a recent science paper that showed that effector cells uh, that are targeting viruses upregulate two other transcription factors. One is called TBET, and the other one is called eomesodermin. And what's found is that um, early effector cells seem to express high levels of TBET, and that, that, those, that is important in um, inducing um, CTL responses. And later on in differentiation, so later effector cells upregulate eomesodermin. And what they showed was that you need both of these um, transcription factors to control virus infections. The other strange thing that was found was that eomesodermin, if you, if you block eomesodermin, so if you have an eomesodermin knockout mouse, the T cells are not as exhausted. So it seems like the exhausted T cells have higher levels of eomesodermin. But if you get rid of eomesodermin, you still get exhaustion. So there's a lot of work now being looked at, looking, uh, looking at these two transcription factors and how, they, how, how they, they are involved in regulation of exhaustion as well as differentiation of T cells, but we still don't know what they're doing. We do know that you need them to control viruses, but their presence still means that you have exhaustion. So it's still kind of a confusing field. Now, clinical trials to block T cell exhaustion are currently in progress, and most of them are being done in the cancer field because when you take tumors and look at the CDA T cells in the vicinity of tumors, they upregulate PD-1 and TIM-3. And so um, a lot of, there's a lot of work being done to look at what happens to the tumor when you block PD-1 or TIM-3. Uh, and most of the work is on PD-1 blocking trials. There are at least three companies that have developed antibodies to either PD-1 or PD-1 ligand. And there's a lot of data to show that in some patients, you get resolution of tumors after a number of cycles of PD-1 um, <clears throat> infusions. The way that the PD-1 is given, uh, this is an example of one trial where they use an antibody to PD-1 ligand. And the doses that have been given are 0.3 to 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight. They give it every 14 days for a period of six weeks, and then they stop and see what happens. And they'll do another cycle of, of six weeks. And what the summary of so far what the data has shown is that you get objective response of about 6 to 14 percent. And these are patients that have terminal cancers that have not responded to standard chemotherapy. So th th this is a, they're selecting for a group of patients that have, have had previous poor responses to uh, tumors. Um, about 20 percent response of stabilization of tumors. What they find is that if the tumor um, expresses high levels of PD ligand 1, then they see a response. So they were able to correlate a response of their antibodies with PD uh, ligand expressions on the tumors. Now, there haven't been any TIM3 blocking trials, but the cancer field is, is very interested in trying out TIM3 blockade. There is, there, there is a PD1 blocking trial in HIV infection that is currently being planned. I don't think any patients have been uh, treated yet. Oh, the one, the one comment that I wanted to make was that in the PD1 blocking trials in the, in the cancer patients, there have been cases of autoimmune disease being induced. So there have been patients with um, pneumonitis, pneumonitis and as well as um, um, autoimmune reactions in the skin. So these, these treatments are not innocuous. <clears throat> And there has been some interest in possibly using treatments where you block both PD-1 and TIM-3. And you have to remember that if you're going to block both of these pathways, you may have an increased chance of inducing um, autoimmunity. Because um, T cells that are autoreactive or that are reactive against self-antigens are pro probably regulated by these same um, negative regulatory molecules. And if you block with antibodies, you might induce autoimmune reactions. So the second uh, talk, aspect of the talk I want to talk about are B10 or B-reg cells. And this is a new, um, a new family of, of regulatory B cells, regu regulatory cells in general. And um, 
This has only been described within the last about five years in, in, in mouse and human models. And the, in, in summary, what, what has been found is that there's this very small population of B cells called B reg cells. And B reg cells are identified as producing IL-10 production. And what has been shown is that if you, um, in, in mouse models, if you deplete B cells, you can enhance auto, autoimmunity. Uh, in, in uh, mice that are predisposed to autoimmunity. And it's been shown that there's a population of B cells that seems to keep autoimmunity in check. And these B cells um, express um, IL-10, and it's felt that that's how they suppress um, autoimmunity, by releasing IL-10 and then suppressing the, uh, the response by, t by uh, cells that are around it. These, these cells actually make a very small percentage of the B cell population in, in general which is a surprise that they're so immunosuppressive. And um, the way that the, these B regs are induced is through stimulation through the B cell receptor, as well as through stimulation through CD40 ligand. And what's also been noted is, is through stimulation by TLR ligands. So it seems like TLR ligands are really uh, potent at um, inducing B regs. Uh, B regs have been studied in autoimmune disease, and it appears that there are defects in B regs in certain autoimmune diseases, particularly in, in, in mouse models. Um, there's also a, a mouse model of Salmonella in which Salmonella induces B regs, and this allows the, the uh, bacteria to persist in the host. So we were interested, or at least my postdoc was interested in studying B regs in HIV infection. I personally wasn't interested, but he was fascinated because it's a new cell population, and so he wanted to look at them. And so this is how he did the experiment. Um, so we identify, we define B-regs as B-cells taken out of the body that express IL-10 when you stain them for IL-10. So it's a very simple stain. So this, this is the methodology that he used. He, he gated for um, B-cells after gating out dead cells and then just stained them for IL, intracellular IL-10 by CD19 staining, which is a typical B-cell marker. And this is a summary, this is an example of one experiment. So this is uh, IL-10 production from an HIV negative, a chronic infection, a chronically infected person that was put on treatment, acute infection, long-term non-progressor, and control uh, stain. And this is a summary slide showing the summary data of, an, of a number of patients studied. And what he found was that B-regs are increased in frequency in chronic HIV infection, which is this group, and in acute um, infection in this group by flow cytometry. He could also confirm this by just culturing the, the B cells from these patients in media and then measuring IL-10 production by ELISA uh, the next day. And again, you get more IL-10 production from, the, from isolated B cells in chronic and acute infection compared to um, HIV negatives. <clears throat> Another way of looking at B regs is to take the B cells out and then just stimulate them with PMI itomycin and then look at the IL-10 production. So we did that as well, and what it does, it, it, it increases the sensitivity at, of detecting these B cells that can produce IL-10. And we got the same result. So chronic infection and acute infection without treatment produce higher levels of IL-10 uh, in the B cells, and this is the summary data of those patients. And the levels of B regs found in the blood of these patients, either not stimulated or stimulated with PMA anamycin, correlated directly with viral load. So the more virus that was present in the patient, the higher uh, frequency of B-regs were found in the blood. We wanted to see how you, we could identify these B-regs with other surface markers. And the markers that we found that could identify B-regs, so the way this experiment was done is that the, um, the, B, the, the CD19 cells that were stained with intracellular IL-10 were gated as being B-reg positive or non-B-reg, and then they were co-stained with these markers. And what we found was that B-regs actually upregulated TIM1 compared to non-B-regs, and as well as this activation marker, CD27, which is found on memory cells. Now, uh, Susan Moyer has been studying B cells in HIV infection, and she found, finds that, um, that in HIV infection, there are B cells with uh, particular phenotypes that are expanded. And these are the stains that she uses to, um, to identify these different cell populations. And this is an example of a stain from an HIV-positive patient. And what she finds is that in HIV infection, there's an expansion of this CD27 um, high, CD21 low population, which she calls exhausted B cells. 
and another population that is CD10 positive, which she calls transitional B cells. These are B cells that are found in the mantle zones of lymph nodes, but you can find them in the blood. So these are expanded in HIV infection. But the Bregs that we found are the black dots. So the Bregs are not part of the cells that Susan Moyer describes. The, they are found in, they are not exhausted cells, and they are not, they're not exhausted cells, and they're not the transitional cell population. The Bregs that we find in patients are actually CD27 positive, and those are the cells that are considered memory B cells, activated memory B cells. <clears throat> now, we wanted to determine whether these Bregs are actually specific for HIV, so what we did is we took HIV trimeric envelope and, and, and labeled it with a uh, fluorescent uh, epitope and then looked at uh, Breg expression based on TIM1 expression, because we know that Bregs um, also are, can, be, can be identified by TIM1 expression. And what we found is that, <clears throat> that TIM1 positive cells are actually enriched for GP140 uh, staining. Um, and here's an example of the GP140 staining. And this is the summary data showing that TIM1 positive cells have higher levels of, of binding to GP140, which means that, that the Bregs are enriched for B cells that actually can bind to HIV GP140, which means that they're, they're, they're um, HIV specific. They're actually binding to the surface of um, GP1, GP140. Now, if you take these Bregs and try to see whether they inhibit T cell responses, you can do this in um, in vitro studies. So what we did here is we took T cells, CD8, in this experiment, we took CD8 T cells from a patient and then co-cultured them with autologous TIM1 positive B cells or an equal number of TIM1 negative B cells and then stimulated them with HIV gag antigen. And you can see that when, when TIM1 positive B cells are present, you have less production of cytokines and degranulation in response to HIV antigens. And this is sort of a summary data of what happens when you add the TIM1 positive cells. You get a decrease in response to all of these um, effector functions uh, from the T cells when you add the, B, the Bregs. You can reverse the suppressive effect of the Breg by adding a soluble IL-10 uh, receptor. This would indicate that the inhibition is due to um, IL-10 release. So you do the same experiment, but in this case, we, in this situation, we added the soluble IL-10 receptor, and what you can see is that you get a rescue of the interferon gamma response in the presence of Bregs. What we then did is that we, we tried to correlate the frequency of Bregs in the blood with the actual T cell response to HIV also found in the blood. So this experiment summarizes that. Uh, on the y-axis is the, um, the T cell response, the CD4 T cell response to HIV by um, CFSC dilution, and this is the CD8 T cell. So that the higher the CD4 and CD8 T cell response to HIV, the lower levels of Bregs found in the, in the, blood, in the blood. So it seems like the, the presence of circulating Bregs inhibits the, the presence of an ex vivo T cell response to HIV antigens. If you, take just, uh, B if you just take B cells from a healthy volunteer and expose them to different TLR ligands, which what you see here, TLR4, TLR9, TLR8, and then look for the presence of um, Bregs by L10 production, you can see that, that TLR ligands can, can induce the uh, differentiation of Bregs in vitro. So we were really interested in this because we know that in HIV infection, um, there's destruction of the gut by a CD4 depletion, and then you get translocation by bacteria. So we wanted to see if, if that is actually happening, then there should be increased Bregs in, the, in gut biopsies of HIV-infected individuals. And this is what we find. So this, what we, we did sigmoid uh, gut biopsies in HIV negative, chronic infection, and acute infection untreated. And we looked for the frequency of IL-10 producing Bregs in the sigmoid biopsies. And we do see that they are increased in um, HIV infection compared to HIV negative. So in summary, Bregs and HIV, um, Bregs are increased in the blood and sigmoid tissue um, in HIV infection. It directly correlates with viremia. They inhibit T cell responses in vitro, and um, the higher B regs you have, the less you, you have of an ex vivo T cell response. 
Uh, these BREGs seem to be HIV specific. They're not exhausted. They have a memory phenotype, and they're induced by TLR ligands. Um, so we're wondering, are BREGs in a, a new immunization strategy that HIV uses to um, inhibit T cell responses? The other possibility that BREGs could be induced to counteract the effects of excessive immune activation that you see in HIV infection. The other thing that you, we're, we're wondering about is that if HIV itself induces these BREGs, and these are, these, are, these are B cells that are found in the, um, in the follicles, the role of B cells is to produce neutralizing antibodies. And we know that when B cells are producing neutralizing antibodies, there's also CD8 T cells that are killing HIV-infected cells. We're wondering whether the B regs might be, prevent, because the B regs are going to be in the area where B cells are, they might be preventing um, CD8 T cells from killing B cells that could make neutralizing antibody responses. Because for, an, for a B cell to produce a neutralizing antibody response, its receptor has to bind to the virus, it'll then internalize the virus and express HIV antigens. Those HIV antigens that that neutralizing B cell will make it as a target to CD8 T cells. So we're wondering maybe B regs are actually um, preventing CD8 T cells from killing uh, B cells that have neutralizing capacity. So that's the summary of uh, the BREG work that we've done. And uh, these are all the people that have been involved with the work. Um, Brad Jones did a lot of the TIM3 work. Sherik Mujib did, has, has done some of the recent TIM3 work. Kira's done a lot of the work on, um, uh, on, on signaling. Ali's done this, the work on um, CTL responses. Colin Kovacs is our clinical collaborator. Um, Connie Kim gave us the sigmoid biopsies. Doug and Lish also helped us extensively on the TIM3 work. Uh, very nice, Mario. A couple of questions on the BREG side of things. So, um, Reinhardt has published, and uh, Dittmar and Hasenkrug have not yet published, but have found that there is specificity for endogenous retroviruses of T-Rex. Have you looked for endogenous specificity of your BREGs? Not at all. I guess we need, we need antigen to, to see. Yeah, we can yeah. give you some. Yeah. Uh, and then the second question, in hepatitis B, there's a well-established model of uh, hep B surface antigen-specific CTL killing um, hepatitis B specific B cells. So that might be a particularly interesting uh, model, particularly in relation to hep B associated cancer, uh, liver cancer, to think about manipulating the B regs. So yeah, so, so B regs are increased in hepatitis B. That's been actually shown. There's a recent paper that came out that showed that. I have a question. Uh, do they have like the uh, uh, ability of proliferation, or it's like all B cells become B regs, or the B regs become B regs? I think they do proliferate. I think they do proliferate, but we haven't Check for pers personally checked for that. But I, the literature suggests that they do proliferate while the, to become B regs. IL-10 is weird because IL-10 is actually important for B cell proliferation. It's a funny cytokine. 